I think the crudest possible way to put how I've organized my career is I've been led by my dick. <laughs> I started drawing when I was a very, very young child. I presented my mother with a pile of typewriter paper that had been folded over, covered with drawings, saying, this is what I'm doing for the rest of my life when I was six years old. Drawing has always been part of who I am. And New York has always been an inspiration, even though I was a country kid. And I always knew this would be my home. And I couldn't wait to draw it for real. When I first moved here, I couldn't afford to go to the movies. I couldn't afford a lot of things. so I. We'd go up to the top of the Empire State Building, and they had no uh, screens up. So I could actually sit on the edge of the Empire State Building and draw. Then I would go out to South Street Seaport, and I would draw again. And it all represented a breathing, living city. The city is a very vertical place. And as a cartoonist, you, you tend more to play with vertical shapes. The water tanks and everything are resting on very high spaces and people live on top of each other in womb-like environments. So the city lends itself to long brush strokes, whereas the country on or mythical lands tend to be much more horizontal. That's why when I did 300, for instance, I went for a horizontal format. And I knew that spectacle is something that you experience as a human being this way, whereas the city is something you tend to experience this way. I've devoted a lot of my career to capturing it because it is alive. Every inch of it's alive. <laughs> Let's get back to Max Gaines. He created the half tab, as it's called, the half tabloid, half the size of the New York Post. He folded a newspaper in half twice and said, I think we got something. And that became the format of the comic book. Now, it adapted over the years for, through strange printing changes to the bizarre form it is now. It's actually three inches shorter than it should be. And nobody knows why, except the racks were built that size. That's how dumb the world of comics is. So much could be done if we just knock all those goddamn racks and boxes down and, 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 and do whatever we wanted to. The 50s had taken their toll on comic books. Everybody took too seriously the, 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 the rash of, of uh, censorship. And also, comics were beaten down economically. They weren't selling. Comics were, the time I entered the field, considered strictly child's play. Creatively, they turned around at Marvel Comics first. <clears throat> you wake up one morning, and your mom wonders why you're a little moody. And it turns out there's these things going through your veins that are called hormones and they make your fantasies a little more violent, and they make you look at girls a little differently. And so your fantasies change. Jack Kirby owned that era. He owns that moment in any man's life. And what Stan and Jack did on the Fantastic Four and the Avengers and all Captain America, all those other titles, is really astonishing comic books, and it's some of the best I've ever done. Jack Kirby just explodes with adolescent power. They were an explosion of imagination. They were everything I wanted out of drawing. It wasn't until Will Eisner that, that I, I went into a much more nuanced um, human look toward things. Several things kept us alive through the, this period. One was the, the underground comics, most, mostly known um, for the work of, uh, of Robert Crumb and Richard Corbin. And then the guys in the mainstream, what we call the mainstream, the guys who did the X-Men and Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D., like Neil Adams and, and Jim Steranko. It was only when my generation came into play that we started waking everybody up again. While Neil Adams, coming from advertising, brought a photographic reality to comics. Um, and, and so his anatomy was just utterly beautiful to behold. The first time I ever saw Neil Adams draw the angel, the X-Men character, and actually saw wings drawn like wings, it was breathtaking. And Neil Adams brought 
a, a photorealism to comics that they've never seen before and instantly outdated everything before him. Jim Steranko brought a, a pop culture sensibility. He brought um, references that from the pulps and from um, uh, just uncanny sources. Everything that was going on in pop culture, Jim Steranko brought to the fore. The outburst of the, of the, of the independent publishers, like Dean Mullaney uh, and Dennis Kitchen, a uh, whole new kinds of comics becoming available. But um, the rest of us had to keep going in different ways. I mean, I came to New York just, just, just really hoping I could make my living doing comic books. I just wanted to tell cool stories about Spider-Man and Daredevil and stuff like that. I didn't have aspirations. I just wanted to do this for a living because drawing was in my blood. <laughs> I was doing Daredevil when I, when I went to um, my editor and said that my character who I created, Electra, had to die. And my editor, Danny O'Neill, said, they'll never go for it. She's more popular than the title character. And I said, well, Jim Shooter's right down the, the, the hall. Let me talk to him. And I went into Jim Shooter's office, and all seven feet of Jim Shooter was sitting there, looking very severe. And I said, Jim, I gotta kill Electra. And he lowered his head, and then he looked back up and he said, tell me a story, Frank. And I told him exactly what I planned to do, and he said, it's great, do it. I had a, a, a powerful ally at the top of the company. <laughs> the old fart came back with a contract with God. What he did was he said, this is where we can go, as something that is not temporary, as something that stays on the shelf, stays alive for, for generations to come. Once it really, I really absorbed it and I, I, I gained enough power in the industry, I started working on my, on my series Ronin as an answer to Contract with God. And I took in influences from France and Japan and everywhere else to create a reckless piece of work that I'm still very proud of because it's, it's, it, you can watch the handcuffs come off me. The notion of authorship really was born with a contract with God. And for me, it was with Ronan. And then I looked to apply it to the old standard heroes with Batman when I did The Dark Knight Returns. Because I, I wanted to create things that would last. They were still stuck on the yellow circle on his chest and so on. And then came up with an excuse dramatically for him to lose his costume. So that he showed up with just a big old bat on his chest, which he's worn ever since. So yeah, part of what I did was trickery. Part of it was having allies in very high places. It was the time I totally internalized the idea that you can throw the pamphlet over your shoulder and say goodbye. And that if your story is 200 pages long, that's great. If it's 148 pages long, that's great. If it's 500 pages long, who cares? It's your story. It was really, for me, the introduction of the sensibility of a novelist rather than a pamphleteer. When Dark Knight came out, when Watchmen came out, people went, wow, this is really scary. This isn't like the, the world of Superman anymore. Now you walk into a comic shop and you see 70 years of history, whereas before you saw three weeks of history. Things have changed now because Eisner stuck his sword in the sand and the rest of us followed up. <laughs> I liked black and white crime movies when I was growing up and I love black and white crime movies now. First off, in black and white, they were able to cut to the heart of the story. Second, how they used film to tell stories in a way that didn't flood you with color, that in fact didn't use it at all, or with detail. Whether a 30-foot room could include only a desk and a lamp and a guy, and you believe it. The thing that people miss is that they went to the heart of darkness, just like Dashiell Hammett did, just like Raymond Chandler did. It crawled inside your skull and showed us all how evil we could be. And then our rare moments of heroism become more celebrated. That's all Sin City's about. It's Jim Thompson's world. It's not Steven Spielberg's world. It's a world where we are, we are driven by ugly impulses and we do 
good things rarely, and we are defined by them. I remember when I started Sin City, I realized I had to finally figure out how to draw cars. And so I bought tons of little cars from like the Franklin Mint and so on. Learning from Jeff Darrow, the artist of Hardboiled, I realized that the best kind of props were three-dimensional. He, he taught me that if you want to draw a gun, get one. There's lots of fake guns that don't, don't actually fire bullets. One of the things that I feel that's amazing about working in the cinema is that there are so few limitations that it becomes dangerous. Working digital process, for instance, you can do anything. So you have to watch yourself and not do too much. Whereas in comic books, you're limited by the page because the page becomes a statement of itself. Its juxtaposition of pictures and so on is finite. And where a cartoonist's worst enemy is time. Because any comic book can be read very quickly. If you know how to slow the reader down, you've mastered the art of comics. Whereas in film, you, you have absolute command over time. I mean, the, the viewer has to sit there and watch unless they're gonna leave the theater. My way is to lay out everything in advance and then to come in and, and play with it. Will Eisner put it best. He, he said it, um, no, no, he said it best. He said inking is sexy. Because when you, when you bring the brush around, for instance, the shape of a woman, it's as if you're running your hand across it. Uh, drawing is more architectural. You're putting things together. I'm not speaking for Will here, I'm speaking for myself. But inking, he would agree, is more where you feel the window and you feel the woman's breast and you feel all the other glorious things that, that, um, that manifest themselves so deliciously in the spirit. What Will Eisner taught me was that you could show what decade you were in, what room you were in, and who you're, you were surrounded by with the corner of a table, with a banister or, or a lamp. Um, I would do it now if I wanted to say somebody was in, say, Los Angeles. I do it with a pile of blackberries. It's the same thinking. It's giving you just enough evidence. That is where the job gets harder and more rewarding. I believe that work explodes. A lot of the best stuff that I do is when I'm snapping a brush full of white paint over my wrist and something just splatters all over somebody's face. And matter of fact, I, I really don't believe in mistakes anymore. I believe that, that there's nothing but instance. I, I wanna see things go completely wild and I wanna be part of it. I think chaos is a beautiful thing. Allowing entropy to take its course and then to guide it and to, and to control it as an artist. It's what a potter does. It's what a bricklayer does. It's what a painter does. It's what we all really do. I think the graphic novel is a very pretentious term to describe something that, 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 that has no good name. I've always been part of pop culture. That's what I enjoy. That's what I enjoy producing. I see nothing demeaning in it. I, I don't think that a smaller audience is a, is, is a sign of virtue. Comics are a young form, so is film, so is the novel. If you flip back the pages of history, all these forms are young. Guys like David Lapham and, and uh, James Tachalka and some of the other guys who are coming up right now, it's just starting to explode. Look at how hungry Hollywood is for, for comic book ideas right now. And most obviously in Iron Man and Batman and so on, but also in things like uh, the Harvey P. Carr's work. It's all changing. We are, we are now standing shoulder to shoulder as uh, sister art forms with film and with literature. I mean, I don't think that there's a big future for say the oral heroic poem a la Homer. I think the Nickelodeon's pretty much finished. The comics are just getting started.